Good morning. Well, I can do two things at one time. I can turn off the mic, I can talk to you, say good morning. After that, the party's over. Again, be mindful of um, Samaritan purse boxes. Some child is going to be blessed because you had them on their mind, on your mind, rather. As you see in your bulletin, guys, we're back in our study in this great book of 1 Peter, rapidly moving through this book, and the Lord's been blessing in the midst of it. I pray you have been blessed as well. As you see in your bulletin, we're starting at chapter 4, and we'll begin our reading at verse 9. At least that's what my bulletin says. I pray yours is the same. Chapter 4, verse 9 of 1 Peter. We've been talking and looking at, uh, at some different and various things that Peter's been showing us throughout this letter, throughout this epistle. And has been blessing us to, to understand some things that maybe before we did not understand. He, he begins here, he starts talking about spiritual gifts a little bit, but he begins at verse 9. If you're with me, say amen. He says, use hospitality one to another without grudging. And we saw this last week, and, and some translations will say grumbling. And, and listen, he's just talking about be hospitable, that, that we be hospitable one to another. And even with strangers, guys, I, I was taught a long time ago, I don't know if I said it last week, but I'll say it this week, that it really doesn't cost anything to be nice, that we can just be hospitable to folk. Um, if they give us a reason not to, if we need to leave them alone, whatever. But, but he says that we ought to do it, and we shouldn't do it because we feel like we have to, and oh man, here I go, i got to be nice to them again. No, it really doesn't cost you anything. And he says, verse 9, he says, use hospitality one to another without, without grudging. And in verse 10 he says, as every man have received the gift, even so minister the same one to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And we saw this verse last week as well, and, and he said, he's talking about this gift. Now, we have spiritual gifts, and we all have at least one. And, and look, shame on you if you don't know what yours is. If you need to know more about it, you can see me at the service, or, or simply go to the Lord and ask him where he has gifted you. But besides that, if you're a servant of God, if you know him for the pardon of your sin, then you've been gifted big time with that gift in, in regard to the gifted, giftedness of salvation. And, and he says here, as every man has, have received the gift, and it starts with salvation, even so minister the same as a good steward. And so he's talking about a caretaker of what he has given. If I put money in your hand, I expect you to be a good caretaker of it or a good steward of it. And whatever God gives us, we are to be good stewards of it as well and treat it, especially with our salvation, as if it's the most important thing that we have because in reality it is. And we need to pass that gift on to others. And it starts with us being hospitable, being able to say something to somebody about Jesus Christ in love. He goes on in verse 11. If any man speak, and we saw this last week as well, again, going into the area of giftedness. And, and by the way, I said it last week, I'll say it this week, that spiritual gifts generally or will fall under either speaking or serving gifts. So he's talking about here someone with a speaking gift or someone who's been blessed to say something to someone. If any man speak, he says, speak as the oracles of God. And, and look, if, if we, we, we can talk about everything under the sun, but many times we avoid talking about God's son. And, and what he is saying is that as we're talking, man, sprinkle some spirituality in there. Yeah, how much can you talk about the weather? How much can you talk about a, 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 a backbiting and talking about folk? How about telling them about Christ? And, and look, in, in, in essence, what he's saying is that we simply need to tell folk what? The truth. Tell them the truth. And, and listen, what, let it stand on its own. Let that be between them and, and, and the Lord, even if they don't want to hear the truth. He says, if any man speak, verse 11, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, uh, again, serving or in, in our giftedness, he said, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth. And he says, if we do that, if we do what God's called us to do, walk in the lane he's put us in, he said that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise 
and dominion forever and ever. And he ends that section, or ends verse 11, and he says, Amen. And in essence, he's saying that, look, if God has gifted you to do what you're doing, then you do it with everything you got. And by the way, you're going to want to do it. You're going to have a desire to do it because God has gifted you to do it. But by the same token, if you're trying to walk or live or minister in an area that is not what God has given you, it's not going to be very attractive. It's not going to be very fulfilling. And it really is not going to, to do what God would have it to do because it's not what he's called you to do. But when you're serving where he's called you to serve, man, it works and it flows and it's very easy. We might see some folk that, that have the gift of giving. I know quite a few that do. And I wonder, man, how could they do that? They just give, give money away, give time away, and, and there's nothing to that, man. It doesn't bother them. And, and the more they give, the, the more it seems God gives them to give. And, and listen, in, in, in the area wherever you are, in, in, in regard to evangelism, man, when somebody calls me to, to preach or teach, I, I was talking to Marsha this morning, I, I got, have to, had to learn to say no because I can't do it all the time and everywhere. So I go to the Lord and ask him how you would have me to use this gift that you're giving me. But by the way, he has given you a gift. And, if, 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 and wherever that gift is, whatever area of ministry, you will want to use it so that you can bring glory to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. He says in verse 12, beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is the triune as though some strange thing has happened unto you. And, and I take note, he's saying not just trial, but fiery trial. And we know that Satan likes to throw fiery darts our way to get us discouraged or, or to get us off of what God has had us to, to do. And, and listen, he's saying it's, it's not uncommon to you. You're, look, Job went through what Job went through. And, and in fact, scripturally, he's the only one that went through that I saw. Uh, not too many went through worse than him. And by the way, whatever I go through, it, it's not even a drop in a bucket of what Job goes through. But God allows these trials for the purpose of, of, of pruning us, of getting us sharper, of bringing us closer to himself. Because guys, I, what, what I know is that being a headstrong man, sometimes I think I can fix everything. Sometimes I think I can take care of everything. And, and God wants me to know that, Brother Ralph, you cannot... And so when he allows these things, it grows me and it also helps me to understand I can't fix everything. So what do I do? I get closer to the one who indeed can fix everything and that's my Lord. And by the way, that's all he wants anyhow. For us to get closer to him and recognize that if he's allowed it, he's the only one, hallelujah, is going to be able to put out that fiery dart. He goes on in verse 13, but rejoice in so much as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye shall be glad, it says also, with exceeding joy. And what he's trying to help us understand is that, guys, look, troubles don't last always. And yes, we go through things here on this earth. We do. We all do. And if you're a Christian, it's even going to be that much more. And look, God didn't really didn't promise us a rose garden. But even when the thorns come, he promised us that he will be there. He'll never leave or forsake us. That whatever we need, he will provide according to his riches and glory. And sometimes we're going to have to go through. But God says, I got you. And listen, it was Paul who said that, 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 listen, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. In other words, I'm going to serve the Lord for as long as I'm here. And if the worst they can do is kill me, they haven't done anything because I'll be home with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So our sufficiency is not in ourselves. Our sufficiency is in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And by the way, he was king of kings and lord of lords. He could have shut down that whole thing at Calvary down if he wanted to. He said, I can call legions of angels and they'll do away with all the evil in the world. But I said, I'm going to do it. I told my father I'm going to do it. And if I don't do it, there's nobody else who can do it. So I'm going to do that because I love my people then and now too much not to do it. And he died for us. And had he not, we all would be on our way to hell. But he did. 
And listen, he was the righteous. He never sinned. And guess what? He had troubles and trials as well. And if he went through, and by the way, he, he did the work of his father. It wasn't even, he, he did what, uh, he came to earth to do the work that his father had called him to do. And we are here on earth representing him as his ambassadors, doing the work that he's called us to do. And, and, and guys, I got to tell you, it's just going, the closer you get to the Lord, the more you get sold out for his cause, the harder it's going to be, but the easier it's going to be because you're going to stop relying on yourself and rely wholly and solely on the one who saved you. And that's Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Guys, please be prayerful with me as I go into this sermon series. Salvation is of the Lord. And Father God, as we dive deeper into this great book, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you'll touch and bless and minister to all of us, Father God, from on high. Father, I pray with, that whatever we got to do when we leave here, we, we got a roast that we got to cook or, or, or we got an appointment we got to keep, Lord. For this next 45 minutes, keep us focused, centrally located, spiritually and physically right here in this place so that we can hear what you have for us, uh, uh, for what you have for our spiritual souls. Bless us from on high, dear Lord. Minister to us in a mighty and a special way and allow these seeds to fall on good soil so that we can grow thereby as we pray in Jesus' name and for his name's sake. Amen. And amen. Still in chapter 4, let's pick it up at verse 14. If you're with me, please say amen. And he says here in verse 14, he says, If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, he says, Happy are ye. And I wrote at the top of ye, what? I'm happy because I'm going through? And in fact, what he's saying is that if we're ill-treated, not for our own mess, but for, for, for the cause of Christ, for the name of Christ, happy are ye. Look, I would love someone to see me or look at me and say, boy, that guy looks different. There's something different about him, the way he acts, the way he conducts himself, the, the way he lives. And what, what Peter is saying is that if somebody recognized that something I'm doing is not of me, but is of, uh, hallelujah, my heavenly father, whose son is Jesus Christ, then, then yeah, that pleases my heart. It, it does me good, man, because I want to make sure I'm doing what he's called me to do and not doing what I want to do. My way had, had been blown a long time ago, but man, when I'm doing it God's way, man, somebody recognizes it as a godly work. That's a blessing to my heart. He says, uh, uh, he goes on, he says, for the spirit of God, of glory and of God rested upon you. And what he's saying is that when with, I'm in Christ, I said I'm in Christ, and now I'm doing something that actually shows that I'm in Christ. He says on their part, and he's talking about Satan's disciples. And by the way, he does have some disciples, and many times he sends them into God's church. He says on their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. And again, speaking about being persecuted for Christ's sake and not for my mess. He goes on in verse 15. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. And, and listen, I take note, man. He, he, he's saying murderer. He's saying thief. He's saying evildoer. And, 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 and in the midst of this type of sin, he's saying busybody. Folk who are fooling around and stuff and backbiting and talk about people that they should not be doing. He links it in with them as well. In verse 16, he says, yet if any man suffer, look what he says, as a Christian, that's the word. He says, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. And, and again, talking about being persecuted for righteousness sake. And look, I, I used to work on, on, a, on a couple of jobs, and, and, and folk who were calling themselves Christian, they would come in. Now, work started 8, 9 o'clock, whatever time it started. And, and they would sit there, and they would open their Bibles, and they were reading their Bibles. And then, the, you know, they, was, they clocked in already. They were actually on the boss's time. They, they weren't on God's time per se. 
And, and then they keep reading the Bible, and it, it's 8, 8 o'clock, and then 8.30, and, and the boss is sitting there looking at him, and, and he lets give him, gives him some slack, and then finally he said, look, you, you're clocked in, you're supposed to be working, and they jump up and holler, oh, I'm being persecuted for righteousness sake. No, you're being persecuted for your sin. You get a break, read your Bible and right now you're clocked in and you're on your boss's time. Don't dare say that you're being persecuted because you're reading your Bible. You're reading your Bible at a time you should not. And, and they would go around talking about how evil the boss is. Now maybe he was evil, but in that instance, you were Wrong. He says in verse 16, yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. And, and by the way, guys, our God is not mean. Our Lord is not mean. He doesn't allow trials because he wants to unseat you. He's not trying to get you to fall down. He, he's not trying to get you to, to, to cry or, or upset or, or, or give you high blood pressure. He allows trials for the purpose of letting you know where you are and be, because you're not really where you think you are. And that grows you, man. It, it, it takes you through, but, but it grows you when you come out on the other side. When, when you're in the midst of something that, that you didn't really cause, it's not because of sin, and you're trying to figure this thing out and, and you're crying out to the Lord. Look, he's going to move. He said he would. But he's going to move in his time. And look, like, like I always say, when you're in the oven and going through, if you have not yet gotten what he wants you to get, he opens the oven, he looks at you, and you still have not repented or you still have not given him the glory, he closes the oven and cranks that bad boy up a few more degrees because you want to learn something and he's going to see to it that you learn. And he's not being mean, he's being loving because he knows what we're going to need tomorrow even though today we might be cruising through. And our reliance has to be more on the Lord and less on ourselves. Amen? He says, also he allows trials many times in a local congregation or a local body. We need to understand, we need to know, especially in the time we're living, living in the last and evil days, we, we kind of need to know who everybody is. There are some guys that I started off with in this Christian walk that I don't see them anymore. I, I, and I talk to them and, and they tell me, well, nah, that, that, that thing, that Christian thing was too hard, man. I, that wasn't for me. I, or I completed what I was going to do. No, this thing here is a lifetime a, a job that God has given us and it never ends and you're going to go through some things and, and listen, it kind of separates the real from the not so real. There's some guys, even some preachers, man, that, that I know was walking with me and man, I really thought they were on board. And right now they're doing whatever they want to do. Something's wrong and there's nothing wrong with the Lord, but their belief system is a little faulty. And, and listen, I'm not going to say what's inside somebody's heart, but God said you can tell a tree by its fruit. And if I'm working with you, if I'm ministering with you, if, I wanna, if I'm trying to treat you as part of my spiritual family, I need to know I can spiritually rely on you. And, and listen, if you're going off somewhere over here or over there and you done put your Bible down and picked up Satan's Bible and you're now walking by his precepts, something's wrong. And God heats it up many times in our lives to prove us just who we truly are. He says in verse 16, yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed on this behalf. And he says in verse 17, for the time is come that judgment must begin in the house of God. And, and, and listen, there was a time in, in the gospel, I believe it was in Matthew 6, and, and, and Christ was saying, look, unless you, you, you consume me, unless you drink of my blood and eat of my flesh, you can't be my disciple. And many of them were walking around saying, man, this, this thing is hard. How can we eat his, his flesh and drink his blood? And in essence, he was talking about just consuming Christ 100% and that he's going to be the focal of your whole life. 
And at the end of that, that chapter, it says that many of, and they use this term loosely, his disciples walked away and did not walk with him anymore. And I'm paraphrasing. And he looked at his hand-picked guys, the guys he picked. And he said, will you go away also? And listen, their words to the, to the Lord was, Lord, uh, Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Guys, once you have, have tasted Christ, once you have consumed Christ, once you have been blessed by Christ, once you have been saved by Christ, where else are you going to go? There's no other place to go. Some of you probably know that firsthand. I know I do. Because I tried to dibble and dabble and, and, and serve Christ and serve the world as well. And the Lord let me know in so, no, not so uncertain terms because of what I was getting back re uh, uh, involved in. He let me know. And look, I didn't hear some words from, from the sky, but he let me know in my heart that, Brother Ralph, I called you. And I called you to be not only a Christian, but a leader. And if you're going to keep trying to go back to that mess, I will literally take you out of here and bring you home with me. Was I a Christian? Yes, I was. But I wasn't being a fruitful Christian. And God was not going to let my mess soil his name. And guess what? I believed him. I believed him so much that I straightened up and began to walk right. Because what I know is that now I'm trying to go back into the mess of the world. I'm still trying to dibble and dabble in stuff I should not do, whether in, in, in actuality or even playing around with it in my mind. God says, I need you to be sold out because I'm sending you to, to some places and I want you to preach and teach to some guys and they need to see that you believe this thing and it needs to be part of your walk, your whole walk, and stop messing around with my name. And I believed him. And, and, and obviously he was o obedient to what he said because I'm still breathing. And that was a, a, a quite some time ago. And, and guys, I, I play around with a lot of things, with cartoons on TV, play around with my wife from time to time, play around with some of you sometimes and joke around. I don't play with God. You know why? Because he don't play. This is life and death, man. This is spiritual life and death. This is heaven and hell, the kind of thing. And he don't play it. He wants us to be sold out for his cause, either for him or against him. There's no lukewarmness. In fact, he says if you're lukewarm in Revelation, like that church, that he will spew you out of his mouth. Can't take it. We either are or we're not. We're not going to play the middle ground. He says in verse 17, for the time has come that judgment must begin in the house of God. In other words, man, right now he's trying to purify his church. He, he wants us to be right. We see what's going on in our world and, and, and listen, we know that evil is encroaching at an alarming rate and there are some souls that still don't know who Christ is and he expects you and you and you and me to let them know who he is, not just by what we say, but how we live in. Because soon and very soon he's coming back for his church. And I dare say, and I say it, and will say it, when he comes back to take his church up to meet him in the air, there's going to be some folk that are down here right now that think they're going up, but in reality, they'll still be here. And, and, I, and I can almost hear an astounding boo when the church goes up and some folk don't. God's not to be played with. Make sure you know what side of God that you truly are on. He says in verse 17, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it first begin at us, what shall the end of them that obey not the gospel be? Uh, a gospel of God. And, and listen, what, what, what's going to be coming them is hell. That's awaiting them. And we don't want to be on that list. Amen. When God was setting up his church, 
in Acts chapter 5. And he wanted it to at least start off pure. And, and he was doing some things with, with the apostles. With, and, and, and he wanted this thing to be right. And, and so folk were starting, man, they were bringing everything they owned, their money, their home, their land. They were laying it at the apostles' feet. And the apostles were giving it out as people had need. Because he wanted this thing to be right in, in, in their minds. And I don't own nothing. It's ours. It's not mine. And it was a, a couple who appeared to be godly, and their name was Ananias and Sapphira. And they came up with a plan. They said, you know what? Everybody is selling everything. They're giving everything. And, and man, everybody's looking at them, you know, just prestigiously. How about we do the same thing, only let's sell what we got. Let's hold back a little bit. And let's just tell them that we're giving everything. Who's going to know? And they did that. And guess what? Peter didn't know, but the Holy Spirit let him know because they had lied to him. And look, Scripture says it was theirs. They could have kept it. They could have sold it. They could have gave part of it, but not lie in their hearts. And they did. And the husband died. And then the wife died. And guess what? The church was reverentially fearful of God, at least when they started. Because God said, we're going to start this thing off and it's going to be right. And I dare say, he says in verse 17, he says, for, for, for the time has come that judgment must begin in the house of God. Guys, we need to investigate our own bodies, our own hearts, and make sure we're right, make sure we're part of the solution, God's solution for this ungodly world and not part of the problem. And if we're not right, God's saying we need to get right because he sees us. And he knows us. And he's going to do something with us. Because the time has come. Amen. He says in verse 18, And if the righteous scarcely be saved. And, and by the way, we are in only by God's grace. Only by his grace. He says, where should the ungodly and the sinner appear? And, and we know they're going to ultimately appear at that great white throne judgment. And, and by the way, if you go to the white throne judgment, you're not going there to figure out whether or not you're going to heaven or hell. You're already guilty. You're just going there to see how much, how much uh, uh, punishment that you're going to get in hell. And by the way, there are different degrees of punishment in hell. And, and I don't have time to investigate it right now, but the Bible helps us to know that. Going there and being without God is, is bad enough, but how worse can it get? For the one who wants to go there through God's church. I don't even want to fathom it. He says in verse 19, Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God. And by the way, it does happen. Many of you have gone through. He says, Commit, commit that keeping of their soul to him in well-doing unto a faithful creator. And the bottom, and that should be the bottom line of my life, man. The bottom line of my life should be Christ. And, and it should be nothing else over him. I, I can't put my, my, my job, I, I can't put my cars, I can't put my, my career, I can't put nothing over him. Because the only reason why I have anything is because he's given it to me. So I give him the honor, him the praise, and make him number one in every aspect of my life. I have moments sometimes when, when I move him out of the way and he friendly reminds me, Brother Ralph, this is getting up too high on a pecking order. You need to get it out of your heart and out of your life. Because I need to be number one. And my prayer is that in your life, your Lord is number one. He says in verse 19, Wherefore let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their soul to him in well-doing unto a faithful creator, in other words, we belong to him. Everything we have is due to him. To him be the glory. Chapter 5, verse 1. He said, the elders which are among you, I exhort. And listen, he's switching gears a little bit. He's talking to the elders here in this letter. And listen, he's saying he's encouraging them. And he goes on, who am I am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ 
and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. And, and listen, Peter is saying that he's admonishing these guys. Look, you're doing a good job. Keep doing a good job. Understand that God called you to this. Guys, guys there are, are, are some days, some Sundays, even some other days, that preachers really don't feel like preaching. I don't know if you know that, but it's true. Sometimes we don't feel like it. Sometimes I don't feel like getting up early in the morning to go teach a bunch of guys that might listen to me or might not. Sometimes I don't feel like in the evening go to a study and, and have these guys look like sometimes they, they're, they're part of us and sometimes they're not. But man, he never asked me, do I feel like it? He simply tells me to go and serve him. And the results are not mine. I leave them up to the Lord. He works that out. And once it leaves me and gets to them, then they're accountable to that. And, and that's also with the ministry he's given you. He's called you to do something, and you are to do it. Sometimes he might tweak you and tell you to call somebody, and you say, oh, man, I don't feel like calling them. But you're hit their minister, and he would have you to do that. And again, it had nothing to do with how you feel. And if you don't feel like it, go to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, make me feel like it. Because I don't want to do it. And we're obedient to what he has called you to do. He says in verse 1 of chapter 5, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Peter saying, I'm in there. He goes on, verse 2, as he's encouraging them, he's telling these elders and these pastors and these teachers, in verse 2, feed the flock of God which is among you. In other words, teach them. They need to learn something. And by the way, they don't need to learn about what you want them to do. They need to learn what God wants them to do. Speak as the oracles of God. He says, taking the oversight thereof, in other words, he's telling them, I need you to be leaders. God's called you to lead. And listen, I look at my life, man, and in all my life, even before I got saved, the Lord has always been putting me in leadership positions where I've been trying to stay back with the rank and file and, and, and hide so nobody sees me. And he always keeps pushing me up, and I never could figure it out. Man, here I am, I'm an unassuming dude. I don't want no part of leadership, but all through all the old jobs and, and everything kept trying to put me up, put me in leadership, and, and I couldn't figure out. Then he called me and told me the day he saved me that, Brother Ralph, you're going to be a church leader. And then it clicked. He's been grooming me all my regular life. So when he saved me, because he knew he was going to call me into leadership, and even now I really don't want it, but he never asked me what I want. He tells me to be one of his leaders. And many times he'll send me to this ministry or that ministry, and, and I see it's out of order. Or I, I see it's not a, a being a godly ministry or, or, or not really Christ-centered. And here I'm sitting here, and I'm looking at other pastors in these ministries, and I'm wondering, well, how come they don't say nothing? They just let it go the way they want to go. And ultimately, I know the Lord said, well, brother, we got you here for that purpose. And now you've got to be the unpopular guy. You've got to say that what you're doing here is ungodly. And I don't want to do it. But i got no choice. If he's called me to lead, i got to lead. And, and listen, again, unassuming leader, because I never see myself that way. And God just said, I don't care how you see yourself. You're going to do what I called you to do. He says in verse 2, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. In other words, be the leader I called you to be, not by constraint, but willingly. In other words, I shouldn't have to wrestle you to do this thing. And by the way, you don't need to try to make somebody follow you. He says, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. In other words, God said, I, I, I called you to do this and I want you to do that. And God, by the way, as far as leading or preaching or teaching, it's almost like breathing to me. i got to do it. And every time i got to do it, I get as nervous as a cat on a hot tin roof because I know this is God's word. I don't want to mess this thing up. And he calls me to do it and he sends me to do it and I go and I do it. And he says, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. 
Hey, in other words, you do God's work and feed God's flock and do what he's called you to do. And if you happen to get a stipend or if you happen to get a check or if they happen to give you something, that's fine. But that's not why we do it. And he's saying that's not why any of us should do it. That we do it for the love of Christ. And we got ministries even right now, some leaders even right now, that, that not only is, is one private plane uh, too much, they got to have two. And if their buddy gets the newest one, then they got to get the newest one. And, and they got to live in mansions and, and even get a mansion for their animal and, and, and on and on. And literally, they're fleecing God's flock. And don't think he doesn't see that. And it seems like they're, they're around for a long time. So how come God don't do nothing to them? Understand that he already has. It's done. They're simply waiting in time for him to do what needs to be done. And ultimately, even if he does not do anything in time, when they leave here, oh, he's going to do something. I'm going to do this for money. Man, if, I, if, if I need more money, I go, go to work. I can get a job. But this here is a calling. And I love it. And listen, I, I, it blows my mind that, that he has called me to do it and allows me to do it. And I'm in this book a morning, sometimes noon, and sometimes night, and I read, and I keep reading and reading, and I keep getting more and more. And, and, and listen, the more I read, the more I understand, the more I learn, the more convicted I get, because I'm not really living up all the way as I should. And that's a good thing. Because I'm being honest with myself, because God's word surely is going to be honest with you. And it's going, it's a mirror, and it's going to let you see yourself for who you truly are. I shared one time before, man, once in my life, once, because God had called me to preach, and it seemed like I had this thing wired. Folk would listen to me, and they'd get excited when I was speaking, and I, I went to a men's thing. In fact, my wife was there. Um, it, it was a men's home or something, and we went. And, and this time, I walked up to the pulpit, and I left the Holy Spirit back in my seat. It was as if I was saying, God, I got this here. Don't, don't, don't bother yourself. I, I'm going to go ahead and do this. And I stood there, and I tried to read the Bible like I'm reading now. I couldn't see the words. And I'm trying to read, and I'm, it sounded like I'm... I'm, I'm got broken English or something because I couldn't see, I couldn't read, I couldn't make it a sense of anything. And my wife did ask me, she said, well, what was going on up there? Now, I didn't tell her at the time what was going on, but what I do know, they didn't invite me back. And I don't much blame them. And when I came off that pulpit that evening, I got with the Lord and I knew exactly what happened. And Lord, I said, I'm never going to leave home without you anymore. And I haven't. And I won't, because I can't do nothing unless he does it through me. Not that good. I thought I was that good that night. Guess what? I was not. And I was shown for who I truly was. And I was literally ashamed, not for myself, but ashamed that I presented God who I said called me in that kind of frame. And I never left home without him again. Amen. And by the way, you don't need to leave home without it either. If, if you're saved, you got his Holy Spirit living inside of you. And, and we need to call on him in, in, in service times, in times of trouble, no matter what's going on. We need to call on him. And, and listen, I got some friends, and not as many as I used to. I really don't have too many anymore. But, but man, if I was in trouble or going through, I'd want to call them and what should I do here? Or can you help me to do this? And, and the Lord started removing folk from my life. And, and I realized I don't really have that many quote unquote good friends. And, and what I realized is that he wants me to rely on him. So when I get in trouble, I call on him first. Now he might direct me to call somebody else, but I call on him. Lord, what am I going to do here? And it's gotten to the point now, man, if I lose my keys, I'm like, where did I put, Lord, where did I put them keys? And, and he had, it, 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 it amazes me how he works that out and has me backtrack. I don't even have to remember where I was, but he takes me right to where I need to be. 
And guys, he will do that in your life as well. I, I don't, I don't, when you, you're looking for a husband, you're looking for a wife, you're looking for a job, you're looking for a house, whatever it is in your life, and whatever it is you need, go to him. He knows. My God, he knows. He knows more than you probably want him to know. But he knows that as well. And we need to keep our eyes fixed on him at all times. In regard to these leaders in verse 3, he says, Neither be as being lords over God's heritage, but being, he says, examples to the flock. In other words, look, it's God's church. He is the chief shepherd. I'm his under shepherd. I don't get you guys in here and say, okay, that's it. You're my flock. Make sure you put money in that offering. Make sure you can't take care of me, your pastor. No. Praise the Lord. Put him first. Because one day I won't be here. And if your eyes are on me too hard, when I go, you might go. But if your eyes are on Christ, man, he never goes. And you will be okay regardless of who's up here pastoring, regardless of what you're going through in life. And he will be a blessing to every aspect of your life. Guys, we need to rely on him for everything. Yesterday, today, and forever. We need to rely on him for everything. Today is what? Sunday, right? And I think it's the 10th of November. I don't know what's going to happen on the 11th of November, but somebody in this room is going to fall into something that they did not plan on. I don't know what it is. So don't come to me at the service and ask me what I, you should do. Call on the one who is already there, and Lord, whatever comes tomorrow, keep me and bless me. Let me get close to you now, because when this thing befalls me, I need to know without a shadow of a doubt that you're going to be there. And he said, I'm a brother, I'm a God that will stick closer to any brother. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will provide for you according to my riches and glory, and his riches are unfathomable. And they never run out. So let's get closer to the one who can do something about our lives that sometimes seem like they're falling apart. Let's get closer to the one that, that man, sometimes I get discouraged and, and, and I need encouragement. Man, he, he'll direct me to a piece of scripture in his book. And man, that thing will fill me up with all kinds of, of, of joy. Let's get closer to the one that can do something about whatever you're going through in your life. And you will realize that, look, not only was he there all along, but he's been there for you to reach out and to touch. And he will minister to you. And he will do to you and through you like no human being ever can. Nothing wrong with friends, earthly friends. We ought to have them. But ultimately, the friend that sticks closer than any brother is Jesus the Christ. And, and by the way, you don't have to use no cell phone minutes to get in touch with him. All you got to do is call him up in your heart. And scripture says he will always answer. You won't get a busy signal. You won't, uh, uh, say a, you won't get a text saying, I I'll call you back. He'll talk to you right then, and he'll bless you right then. And whatever you need in this life, he's going to provide. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for this ministry moment, for this time. And, which we can look through a few verses of scripture in your word, Father God. We pray in the name of Jesus that these words have fell on good soil, Lord, starting with me and then spreading out to the congregation. Lord, whatever they're going through, whatever we're going through, whatever we need, please touch and bless and continue to cut, touch our heart in regard that you already got the answer and you already got the fix. Yes, the fix is in. And that fix was in from the moment that you died and rose at Calvary's cross and called us to be your child. Hallelujah. We are children of the Most High God. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. 
We ask that you would uh, look down on our prayer list and, and bless as you see fit, Father God. Many names on there, Lord. We, we, we know the family of Donna Carter, Connor. They, they indeed need a, a touch from you, Lord. Her, her leaving here, she had been sick for so long, and now she's gone, and they're going through some things. Father God, minister to them in a mighty and a special way. And, and for anybody else that's going through, Father God, in the, within the sound of my voice, let them know that you have already said in their life, peace, be still, because you have already done the work that needs to be done. Father, we thank you. We praise you. Father, we say yes to your will and to your way as we pray in Jesus' name and for his name's sake. And let God's church say, amen. amen. God bless you guys and thank you.